he noticed that politicians struggled to enact the things they run on, that regardless of who wins elections, politicians find they cannot pass whatever legislation they like. They find themselves bound by what is popular, or at least their sense of it. They can only act within a narrow set of ideas, and that range is called the Overton Window. And on the Overton Window podcast, we look at issues around the country and talk to the people who change what is politically possible. Can tweeting SpongeBob memes change policy? I wouldn't think so, but I would be wrong. Uh, today, we are joined uh, with uh, joined by Shoshana Weisman, the director of digital media at the R Street Institute, where she covers technology. Shoshana, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, tell me uh, what you're trying to accomplish with your Twitter account. So it's just funny, you know. I uh, I never thought that being so clearly who I am would uh, would work in politics. Um, but I just I want regulatory reform. I want regulations to work better. I love working at the R Street Institute. Most of our stuff is basically free markets and regulatory reform. So that that's all we want. And it turns out you can use SpongeBob memes to get you there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, let's dig in on on some of that and say clearly who you are. Um, how, how did you care about regulatory policy? So, um, there, there. I think that the biggest way this happened, and it's really funny. It's not like it, it's not like heartwarming. It's just very nerdy. So I've uh, I've been a Federalist Society member since I was 16. And uh, I think when I was 19, I attended the Federalist Society Convention. I just wanted to learn more about law. I'd taken some con law classes in uh, college, but it never really made much sense to me. The standards of review, I'm like, why? Why here? Why not here? Why? I don't understand the logic for applying it. And then I heard Randy Barnett talk and uh, he was getting into the 14th Amendment, uh, unenumerated rights and the theory there that all rights deserve protection because there isn't an ink blot on the Ninth Amendment, like uh, Robert Bork had said. And I'm like, oh, yeah, why Why do we treat rights differently? And that leads you to economic liberty. Is that all 16-year-old thoughts? Yeah, normal, normal stuff. <laughs> um, so, then, uh, so then I started getting more involved in the Federalist Society, reading a lot about unenumerated rights, and it leads to licensing. Um, well, shortly thereafter, I heard Clark Neely, who's now uh, a VP at Cato, uh, he was speaking about licensing reform and the Louisiana Florist case. And uh, and that just that hit me because learning that someone um, wasn't able to be a florist because the government just didn't want them to. And they had failed the physical exam where you arrange flowers and mm. those flower arrangements were dangerous or not up to code. That, that was just nuts to me. And finding out that that woman died in poverty because the government wouldn't let an elderly widow work to do the things she knew how to do. Oh, that it still makes fire in my veins. And that that kind of set me off. That That's when I was like maybe 12 years ago, like, yep, licensing reform is the rest of my life now. That, that's yeah. what I'm doing. <laughs> and so in addition to, I mean, you write papers, you do analysis, you do like a lot of the things that a normal think tank person uh, does on this issue. But like what you're noteworthy is doing something that very few other people do is find humor in social media, and then constantly sharing interesting and thought-provoking things through social media. How'd you come to do that? Thank you. So it's funny, I, I'm digital first, and I think that really helps. Not a lot of people bridge between digital and scholarship, and a lot of those who do struggle to do it right, because it's a hard thing to do. Um, not, not necessarily inherently, I just don't think the skills often come together in people. Usually people are like in the weeds and like, that's it. Or their, uh, or their surface level, not in a bad way, but in a way that helps communicate things. And that's it. And they don't get in the weeds. But I like doing everything because I can't sit still. So I uh, I got into digital media in high school. I ran uh, social media for campaigns. When I was 19, I ran uh, communications for a congressional campaign. And I learned a lot there. I learned I hated traditional comms, but I loved, loved using social media to reach people. Just to barge in, did you win? No, no, it's alone. Uh, it, it's <laughs> wild. There's a whole story there. We lost very badly. Uh, our name, the, the candidate's name wasn't on the ballot, even though it was supposed to be. Crazy levels of corruption within the GOP in New York. It, it's a whole deal. We totally lost. But um, I learned you could reach donors on LinkedIn because they're not on, tw at the time, at least not on Twitter, not on, I don't think Instagram existed back then, <laughs> but uh, they were on LinkedIn and you could join a group and just reach them. And that was a great way to reach people very easily in a way that you really couldn't otherwise. 
um, you know, their emails were still full, but on LinkedIn, they would check and be like, oh, yay, this, this guy's doing good or not doing good. He needs help. It was a really good way to do it. And I love that control, the analytics. Um, and then uh, I I'd started writing about uh, licensing reform a couple of years, or maybe about a year later when I got an opportunity to start writing. Um, and then when I joined the Weekly Standard, uh, I got to write there while I did digital media. And here at R Street, I was worried I wouldn't be substantive enough for a think tank. And uh, within my first week working here, not even thinking I was going to go the fellow route in addition to the head of digital media route, um, I had an idea for a paper and we submitted it to National Affairs and it got accepted like my first week. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can scholar. I want to talk about uh, humor um, because humor is a thing that is really tough for think tank people to do. I think a lot of us are, are uh, we're normal people, uh, in at least not normal people outside of our interest in policy and uh but but part of that means is that we're funny among our friends we do have a sense of humor but he, comedy to people other than our friends and our family is really tough like it, it 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 can get offensive you can get like you can get into a lot of trouble by trying to be funny and most of us just aren't the kind of funny that translates well into social media um so what are you trying to do there so it's funny. I just tried seeing if people liked who I was over time. And that included a lot of humor. I've had n- not in a self pityingly but I've had a lot of difficulties in life. I have 12 autoimmune diseases now and rising. I want to get a world lot. record, but Guinness doesn't track it, which I'm a little upset about because I want to win. And I think I can win. I think I, if I spend some time with my doctor, I can win. But I've had like a lot of hard stuff in my life. And like you just if you don't laugh it off, like it's not you're not going to have a fun time like if you're in constant pain and like, and you can't find a way to laugh it off, like you just got to figure it out. So I think it's a lot of that. I've always lo- I loved making people laugh. Even when I was a kid, I loved like when I did school presentations, I would do it as stand up basically. Um, and everyone always loved it and left laughing. And I kind of take that wherever I can. So if I'm talking with an elected official, I kind of like will feel out if, if I can make them laugh a little bit. Um, and one of the biggest compliments that uh, I have is I'm close with Governor Doug Ducey, the former governor of Arizona. He's one of my favorites, and I call him my son because I'm so proud of my growing boy and all the good stuff he's doing. Um, and he always says that one reason he loves working with me is because I'm fun. And that really stuck with me. Like, it's it's cool to know that that they, they enjoy that a little bit, that you can have fun with them. And it's the same on social media, whoever you're reaching. People like to laugh a little bit. If you can make them laugh, they'll remember things because it's an emotional reaction. You can go the anger route and there's nothing wrong with it if it's warranted. But laughing's a really good alternative to the anger route too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, at least from your perspective, what do you think your social media engagement has accomplished? So it's wild. I, I actually have specific examples. Like, when I first joined R Street, uh, the Alabama, I forget exactly the name, but their board of alcohol was going to ban margarita pitchers because they're like, oh, well, people can use this to hit each other and, you know, break the glass and whatever. And I'm like, that's really stupid. So I shamed them so much that they called us out and said, oh, this wasn't a final rule. We were just considering. <laughs> so I stopped a regulation by just making fun of someone really hard. And I've done that a couple of times. Um, I've made friends with elected officials who then like, want to work with us on licensing or other reforms. I met the mayor of Oklahoma City basically through Twitter. And within a couple of years, he asked me to review all the licenses the city had and tell him what he should remove and and uh, keep. So I gave him recommendations and I told him it's up to you, but this is some stuff to consider here. He got rid of uh, uh, 16 of the 19 licenses at the city level, consolidated two and kept one. And that was like, that just happened because of Twitter. And the time I spent in an Excel sheet. Um, other times it's messaging, showing people why issues matter, like regulatory reform is no fun. But if you say, hey, someone died in poverty because government wouldn't let them be a florist, you know, people get interested. So I, I love getting to do all that, being able to help and make reforms and make the connections that lead to reforms. So it's kind of all of that stuff together. And I'm really thankful that I've had the opportunity. So I'm, I'm just trying to think through of like why an elected official might care about social media and what people say about them on social media. And I mean, I would love it. I think it would be very useful to our elected officials if they could get on Twitter and find out, you know, how popular their issues were uh, to their to their constituents. But you can't really use it for that. Uh, 
uh, at least not that I know of, maybe there's some uh, social media tech wizardry out there that can help people do district polling, which is really expensive. And um, but uh, but outside of that, I mean, it's still a useful tool to building reputations. And so, like you said, with the margarita uh, issues, like no one would pays attention to Bureau of Alcohol Control rules, but you did, and you were able to get a lot more interest in 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 that subject enough where they're like where they backed away from it um and i can also see you using your social media account to cheer people on when they do good work and that is something that i think a lot of lawmakers want they crave that they don't get that being a, being an elected official means you get yelled at a lot by strangers um so how uh is that what you're trying to accomplish uh with yeah. some of your work so actually, one thing I want to mention, too, is you're totally right. Like, you can't float ideas on social media if you're an elected official and see what people think. But you can look up people's reactions to other organizations or people floating the same ideas. So you can find a couple of big or medium-sized accounts. You'll, you know, not to say this would be it, but like uh, universal basic income. Like, if people wanted to do that, they could totally find a bunch of accounts tweeting about it and seeing people's reactions. Um, and that's actually a good way to research. It's not representative, but it does show you the the breadth of it, not the representation, but the breadth of views um, and how people might perceive it on the positive and the negative side. And that's something really useful for us. I actually watch negative replies to our tweets very carefully, and I try to minimize them, not by changing our views, but if I realize, oh, I'm talking about this in a way that's not relating to them, I can fix that. Like something like that's really easy. And because of that, we don't really get a lot of pushback to our ideas on Twitter which is really nice, even LinkedIn, with uh, some exception. Um, but then uh, if you look at the replies to any elected official, it's just mean and cool, often racist, just nut stuff. And no one's there being like, oh, my gosh, I love all the work you do. And I'm there being like that because if, if someone's doing great work, I want to get them to do more of it. And if they have the positive association with someone praising them, then we can build on that. Like uh, the Pennsylvania governor, Josh Shapiro, is doing some amazing licensing reform work and some other great work, some other work I don't love, but that's okay. I don't have to yell at him. Yeah. It's not my place. But if on my issues, he's doing pretty well, I'm glad to be like, this is great. Let's do more together. And um, then other people see that and say, oh, wait, I can get positive attention if I do this. Well, I wanted to do this anyway. I just didn't think it would help. And I have other priorities, but maybe now I'll do this. You can really build a lot of good by doing that. People think it's all about just yelling at elected officials. And I love that too. And I will do that. <laughs> but I really try to praise them. Even um, There's some who are really great. If I disagree with them, I'll be like, hey, I love your work, but I disagree on this. Could could I could I have a meeting with you? Could I bring in our streets people? And usually they're pretty nice about it and, and pretty open to it, which is something I really appreciate. And I try to praise them for that. Like John Cornyn's amazing that way. So I'm like, I try to raise him up as a guy who will listen, which is really nice, you know? That's that's really interesting, and that's smart, too, because I think that takes advantage of some of the incentives that our lawmakers are facing around all of their engagement, because now we have more access to people and celebrities and elected officials than we ever had before. There's more places to form their reputation, and um, like you said, like the uh, online, there's just so much negativity like we are a lot forwarded anonymous speech and a lot of us uh use that to become the worst versions of ourselves and you're saying well this also gets a lot of attention we can shower praise upon people when they do good work and get some positive attention and maybe someone's going to see some benefits from uh by doing that and it looks like that theory is correct uh can you uh as in like You've showered praise on people. They've done some good work and they've tried uh, and they've used some of the attention that you've given them to do some more good work. Um, how optimistic are you about social media? I think there's a lot of good to be done on it. People use it for wrong. What's actually interesting, too, is that there's research showing that anonymous speakers are often less incendiary than, than non-anonymous speakers. Mm, it's an okay. assumption I had, too, because you see yeah. a lot of it. But turns out at the like Y level, people who are, who have their personas atta attached are actually worse, which is kind of funny to think about. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it is kind of funny. It's the case. Um, but yeah, I think you can just change the incentives. I mean, I can't do everything by myself. Like I'm not like, oh, I'm changing the world, but I can make a couple of good things happen and maybe open some minds in the process and reach people who I couldn't have otherwise reached. Like, um, I learned some of this when I was at America Rising PAC, which is a Republican oppo research PAC. We started when we were like 
talking about Hillary Clinton back when she was running, I didn't make it partisan. I was said, hey, she said this on energy, but she also said this on energy. You can't trust her. And Bernie Sanders people were sharing it. And I'm like, that's wild that it's just the message. You can get through the message if you're not like, we're Republican, we're Republican the whole time. And it's the same thing with policy. If I'm like, hey, you know, I think people on your side would might like it for this reason. And I know you've done work here that relates here. Um, and then people on your side might like it for these other reasons or some of the same reasons. You know, you can really bring people together um, at the Weekly Standard. Bill Crystal's obviously um, a neocon. And when I shared his work on Tumblr, like the furthest left mm. people loved it. They didn't know who Bill Crystal was, but they loved his work. And it's just the, when you get rid of the labels, you can really do some good work. So I took that and now I use it in policy just to bring people together, to nerd with everyone. Um, and with rare exception, everyone's been pretty great about it. Like I've worked with Elizabeth Warren on licensing reform. And I've worked with Tom Cotton on licensing reform and even on tech policy, like Ron Wyden, the, the father of Section 230. I've worked with him there. And um, and then people way far on the right, like Rick Santorum's kind of on our side with that. But it's just it's amazing what you can accomplish with positive attitudes and just saying, hey, we're not here to criticize. We're here to help. Or even if we are here to criticize, we're here to be a helpful critic, not like we're not here to yell at you. We're here to like they hit hear stuff you might want to consider. And even if it's not fixing it, maybe gets a little better. Yeah. Is social media where people's minds are changed? It can be. It's not always, but if you do it right, it can be. Mo I mean, the, ins the, ins the monetary incentives are not for that. The monetary incentives are definitely for just, you know, uh, uh, preaching to the choir. But uh, if you work at a think tank and you don't have to worry about making money off your audience, then you can do it. Um, so organi actually, that it's a good case for like for for um, basically for not using small dollar donors for stuff because those small dollar donors tend to like the preaching to the choir more. Not to say larger donors don't, but I think it makes it harder for grassroots organizations to change minds sometimes because of the way the incentives work. Um, but if you're if you're you work at a think tank and you can just work on policy and you can change minds, you have really great opportunities. It's not going to get you endless followers. It's not going to make you the biggest account, but it'll, it'll make you an important account that can do good stuff. I've seen it with others, too. Um, there's a lot of good examples. I'm just one of many, but um, it's amazing that I have people who are communists following me who like licensing reform. I just think it's the funniest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I guess uh, it. I'm uh, just trying to think, like, there are some really interesting people doing interesting things on uh, online, making good arguments. A lot of that's not necessarily what 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 sh uh, what people see. Um, can you can you give me an example of someone whose minds you help changed? Yeah, it's been a lot on licensing reform. Just random people will come to me and say, you know, I used to think this, but you have a really good point here. I didn't think about how all this works out. How the license isn't working. Um, with elected officials, there's definitely been some that wanted to do age verification for social media. And I explained to them, here's some cybersecurity risks you might not have considered. Here's some First Amendment issues. They're like, oh, we didn't realize that there's already precedent here. And there's, it's pretty subtle. And I'm, you might want to consider that. So sometimes they'll back down from ideas or jump onto something else. Or, um, other times people want to license something and they'll ask me for my opinion and I'll say, well... You know, here's how it's working in other states and the rates of harm are the same. So I'm not sure that that's going to, you know, do anything. Um, sometimes people just haven't thought through an issue and they just want different opinions, uh, different opinions. And if you make the wrong assumption that their mind's already settled, you lose an opportunity to change a mind. So I think it's it's kind of all of those things together. Even just willingness to work with people. Um, Man, I, even growing up before I got into policy... I was always like the right wing person that people liked, like the exception to the rule that right wing people were evil. But uh, I like being that and saying, hey, there, there's more of us. We just got to talk to each other and not make assumptions about our foundational thinking. Why do so few people do it like you do? Thank you. I, it's funny. It's just it's hard with the incentives when you see models of like people just saying mean or inaccurate things for attention. It's just. I don't think people see always see people like me and others who are doing it this way. I think it's definitely doable, but it's it's sometimes hard. You have to be careful about how you word things and and ch always challenge your assumptions of just wording and uh and what what will offend people. And not to say everything has to be PC, 
But if you can reach someone to change someone's mind by excluding one or two words, that's kind of worth doing, you know? Yeah. I uh, Every once in a while, I talk with our editors uh, before posting something. I was just saying, give me a tone check. Is this too mean? Is this, um, or or is this understandable? Uh, and it, those those things kind of help. And I'm not really using uh, using it uh, as a way to attack people most of the time. But uh, and and one of the things that I found, and I don't know if this is uh, your case too, is that often when I engage with someone who's being really negative about my work, they immediately become more friendly. Um, yeah. As in, like you gave them some attention, you res- offered some respect uh, respect to them, and uh, in in way that they didn't expect and sometimes you have like i've had i know a lot of people haven't had this experience but good policy discussions with people who know a lot of interesting things about things by uh, responding with respect absolutely there's an exception to that though if someone's really nasty to me i have no problem telling them to off and i will do so very happily and i'll make an example out of them but if someone's like hey i don't think i agree like i think you're wrong about Mm. this Then I'll dive in and say, okay, you know, uh, you know, here's where I'm coming from here. And sometimes it ends with, you know, we're just going to disagree here. But there have been a lot of times where they're like, oh, I didn't realize this or, oh, I didn't connect these dots here. But um, I think it's also important to stand your ground and not, you know, not back down. If someone's um, being awful to you, feel free to make an example of them and and just call them out and make fun of how dumb they are. The um, the other day for April Fool's. We did um, uh, that our street was going to launch a center for the seven seas because our street like pirates and stuff. Yep. And we do a lot of yep. art jokes. And we had like a list of policy reforms, including uh, uh, repealing the Jones Act, just having some fun in the maritime industry. Well, we tweeted out. Um, want to get rid of the Jones Act. Oh, yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought it was funny to have like a real one at the end of like some silly ones. And the maritime industry retweeted us and said, it says a lot about this organization that we can tell if this is a joke or not. So I retweeted and I said, um, shocker, Jones Act supporters admit they're morons. And like, they were like so hurt. They they replied with like a promotional video for them. And like, congrats, you don't know how to use social media. And I ripped them. But if they had been like, like if they had like joked on top of that, I would have liked that. Like that would have been fun. Like a, we're actually um, launching a center for Jones Act. Like we love the Jones Act and like just something silly. I wouldn't have minded, but they were just so petulant and so mean. So then I got everyone to make fun of them. And that's totally okay. I like not everyone's into that. I'm totally into making fun of mean people and making them feel bad about themselves. But if if they have like the tiniest bit of like openness or niceness, I'm always, you know, trying to engage. But uh, but I also enjoy making fun of them, too. <laughs> So you engaged in one of the issues that is near and dear to my heart: occupational licensing. These are uh, unne- uh, they are often unnecessary uh, barriers uh, barriers to work that protect industry incumbents at the expense of people who want to enter the in- uh, the industry and everyone else too. What do you bring to the table on the issue? Yeah, so I t- just go where people are interested. It- it's always hard with the lobbies, I'm sure you know. Oh, the cosmetology lobby is vicious. I have never seen a lobby as powerful or vicious as they are. It's so weird to me. But it's funny when they see me, they're like, oh, you have purple hair. You must be a cosmetologist. I'm like, oh, you're making some assumptions you're going to regret. <laughs> but um, whenever I go to a state and they're interested, I just ask them, you know, are you are you open to like getting rid of licensing for some professions? I know that's harder. Or do you just want to do universal recognition, which is also great, but it's not the same. You know, it has different effects or military spouse or immigrant or even the justice reform angles. So I just tell them what possibilities there are and then ask what they're interested in. And then if they're like, yeah, let's repeal all these licenses at once. I'm like, OK, that's going to bring out all the lobbies at the same time against you, including ones not included because they're going to be afraid they're next. So let's not do it that way. But let's let's maybe do one by one, see how it goes and then work towards more. Um, But I just try to, you know, roll with what they're open to. Some people only want universal recognition and I'm fine with just better. I just want to make it better. So any way to make it better, I'll just go with. Yeah, uh, well, that's that's an issue right now where like. This is an issue where most uh, most states have, uh, at least for for our side, we've already lost in most states as an occupational licenses cover a a wide and expansive uh, scope of practices. Uh, they they have extraordinary bounds to uh, that are completely unconnected to uh, protecting public health. 
Um, and but there have been people who have been paying attention, who have been calling for this for years. I mean, economists have been skeptical about the uh, the benefits of occupational licensing for years, but economists are not good advocates. Um, uh, that that brings it to people uh, people like us to try and change the political incentives to uh, to do this. And one of the things, or to uh, to make important changes uh, to these laws, and there have been recently. Like it's it's only over the past fifteen years that people that there have been any movement in the opposite direction. And I think some of that is because there's been more attention paid. And I think like what you're doing matters a lot because this is a. Uh, this is an issue of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs, like so much of public policy, where it's uh, where public policy is used to create um, benefits at the expense of the public. And the way that you break that is by drawing more attention. And social media can do that in a way that just wasn't capable 20 years ago. Uh, so can you talk about some, some of that? Because I think yeah, I mean, bring a lot of attention to this. <laughs> it's crazy that I have almost 70,000 followers who care about regulatory reform and sloths and hiking. It's amazing. It's just, <laughs> this wasn't a thing. Like, I couldn't have started a magazine 20 years ago. People would have been like, why would I ever subscribe to this? Like, that's ridiculous. But here, you can do it. It's just amazing. And people want to hear these weird stories. Unfortunately, people will use it for evil and make up stories and stuff like that or exaggerate or leave out details. But a lot of it is real. Like, you can find the, the florist story always gets attention people are always floored by that or um learning the disconnect between uh the means and fit or the racial disparities people are really interested in all of these things and you can get a lot of attention there but it's because of social media it's funny it, it ties in with my age verification work too because i started on social media when i was a lot younger when i was 14 i started networking on facebook and it's why i am where i am today i even found out i had fibromyalgia from a small forum and the possibilities of information sharing on social media are, are just so great that, of course, if a parent doesn't want their kid on social media, they should not have their kid on social media and put up blockers and stuff. But um, but all of my work kind of ties together here because of I believe in, in robust information sharing and not having the government get in the way of that, um, whether that's First Amendment rights for people speaking as their profession, like tour guides, which are licensed in some places, which are it's just ridiculous. So I, I, we've. We've had our friends at the Institute for Justice on talking about this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so whether it's that or even just minors having the right to access speech online, um, again, unless their parents say no. And and uh, and when the government does it, there's cybersecurity issues. When parents do it, there's really not. So that kind of helps there. But um, all, all of this is just about information sharing. Like you can share information now that people, you couldn't have found the people who wanted it so easily a long time ago. And now... They just search for licensing reform if they're interested in that. Or marmots. I love marmots. And I'm always tweeting about marmots. Or sloths. You can find all this stuff together in a way that you just couldn't have before. And it's also why I'm such a techno-optimist. You know, it enables such incredible things. Even um, in a similar kind of vein, I was talking with the governor of Montana, who's also one of my sons. And he was talking about how he's using AI to um, reduce or to figure out how to simplify regulations that basically... He, he looked into it and uh, an AI model looked at Montana's regulations and said that basically you need 10 years post high school experience to even like really understand them, which is nuts. Like I have three and a half th and three years post because I graduated fast because I was bored. But, um, you know, I have a bachelor's degree and I, I struggle to read this sometimes myself. And I've worked in this and I, I often have to go to colleagues and say, hey, this is what this says. Is this what that really means? And I'm an expert. Like, that's so bad. So he wants to make an AI model that can simplify it. And I love the intersection of tech and regulatory reform. There's some really, really great stuff to be done, whether on social media, through advocacy, or even through finding examples of people harmed by things. Um, you know, I know that the Institute for Justice sometimes leverages social media to find people. Um, but even for the government, if someone has a problem, they can more easily gain attention and get to the front of the line. And maybe a really big problem can be solved because of it. It can work in really healthy ways. It doesn't always have to be us yelling at each other um, or being mean to each other or being insane online. There's so much good work to be done on it. Um, there's obviously bad stuff too, but um, but I'm just I'm always so excited when I can connect with new scholars or 
scholars who I might have had trouble reaching when I was younger before social media was as big a thing. And I can tweet them being like, oh, my gosh, I have your I love your work so much. But I also have a question like I love that. It's so great. Shoshana, thank you for coming on and good luck in your attempts to shift the Overton window. Thank you so much for having me.